Welcome back to Think Tech. Now, this is uh, Transitional Justice, and uh, our guest today, uh, who joins us from Lisbon, uh, is Bruno Del Papa. Welcome to the show, Bruno. Uh, thank you, Jack. Nice. Thanks for the invitation. It's nice to be here. Uh, thanks for being with us. So Bruno is a physicist, but he's also a, a computer guy. And today we're going to talk about how AI and other data processing uh, helps Project Expedite Justice do its work in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so let's let's first start with um, how AI is different uh, than the data processing that we used to think about. So yeah, it's I think it's a good point to to start and um, first. Well, so first, by AI, we already mean different things. So uh, there's different kinds of models, different kinds of problems that AI tries to, to solve. Uh, broadly, I would call now AI a uh, combination of so machine learning, deep learning models that have evolved in the last 20 years or so with the computer capacity that has also evolved. So we have ways of dealing with large volumes of data that are necessary for AI. But those, sometimes people don't, when they mean AI algorithms, they don't include those. They mean more like the models that, uh, quote, think like humans, which they, they do not. Uh, that has always been very clear. Um, but AI is just a broad term for that. So how it differs from normal or, let's say, old statistics is just by the size. So statistics in the past has been able to deal with, well, a reasonable amount of data, but today we just increase the amount of data we have available by many, many orders of magnitude with the advent of so internet, computers, uh, processing capacity, and so on. Uh, and like AI algorithms were a way to deal with this. So it's a very fancy new word for applied statistics with very specific uh, methods and algorithms that have been developed in the last years for to deal with this data. Uh, yes, that's probably a short answer. <laughs> okay, well, no, that's that's fine. Wanted to get some distinction going. You know, when we when we think of AI, we think of uh, facial recognition for one thing. You know, like Xi Jinping has got uh, you know uh, uh, the Western China and the Uyghurs all wired up, and they can recognize any face, and uh, and he's doing that actually all over China. And uh, for that matter, uh, the UK has a lot of cameras around London, and they can recognize, uh, you know, using AI, they can rec recognize faces. So does this help um, in Project Expedite Justice's work? Um, if you can recognize faces using AI facial recognition? So uh, at the current moment, that's not anything I'm working on, but it has the potential to help. Uh, essentially. As you mentioned, there are many, many different models for facial recognition. I think it's maybe the one classic case that uh, governments have been using. And you can use that if you have enough data to train your model. So one very important feature of AI is AI is only as good as the data you use to train your models. I think that is that is very important. So in the Chinese case, they do have a crazy amount of data that they use to train their models, so they can easily identify some kind of key facial points and facial features. Uh, I'm sure in the UK, the government has similar uh, approaches. Uh, what an organization such as PJ could do is if we need to, we have videos that have been recorded by witnesses, by media, or that sometimes people post on social media. Uh, and in these videos, you have faces that could appear. Can we identify them? Potentially, we can identify the same person, the same face appears in different videos. Um, and that's uh, just uh, as a common, it's not only limited for, for faces. You can identify, for example, cars, vessels, or any anything, essentially. Anything that you can train the model to identify, which is something that is quite new. It's something that has been developed in the last maybe 10 to 5 years. Mm, well, you know, that, that really speaks of... Um... The um, network uh, network analysis. What I mean by that, maybe that's an old term, but um, if if I have, um, say, a stack of email, let's say I have mm, twenty million emails, okay, and I want to see uh, where you, Bruno, have appeared in an email, 
um, with uh, regular data processing, I can, you know, and we have been for the past 20 years after 9-11, the U.S. government has used that uh, to uh, go through those emails and find every time uh, Bruno's name appears. Um, but now uh, with AI, we can do it much faster and we can get what more reliable results. Can you talk about how that works? Yes. Uh, so it's not only a matter of much faster, it's that you can also infer the context in which my name would appear in the emails. It's not only like a, let's call it a brute force search that you go through uh, the text very quickly. You also now have uh, models that are able to understand some of the text and understand uh, in which context his name has been used and to what other names or what other words or what other companies this name has been linked to. And also, not, you mentioned only email, but what is the case in, in reality is that you have different kinds of databases. For example, emails, videos, uh, registers of companies in some country, they are all in different formats, right? So we also need to uh, some kind of software that would look at these different formats, right? Which is one thing that was not possible before. I mean, now combining different kinds of data is one of, one of the key points. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and, you know, I'd like to sort of jump off that track of, of thought now and say, well, just as um, Project Expedite Justice and, say, prosecutorial authorities uh, in Europe looking for war criminals can use this technology to get a beat on where you have been, Bruno, what you have done, who you have consorted with, um, you know, what, what points of um, life experience um, you know, will help to define you. Um, the government can do that too. And actually, the government has greater resources to do that. So it's the old story about how technology has two sides to it. Um, what are you finding in that regard? Um, to study AI means to study both sides. Uh, where are governments, especially autocracies, going? Well, it's always, well, I try to be optimistic about technology in general, but I tend to see AI as a very powerful tool uh, that everybody can have access to. I mean, you mentioned governments, but I would also add these huge tech companies, uh, for example. Uh, they can train models on people, on what information people openly put online on their profiles, their social media profiles to show their friends. They want sometimes to have, I don't know, some funny glasses on their face images and so on. And people just give this data for free. And not only to governments, not only to autocracies, they give it to companies that own those pieces of software, right? Where this is going, well, I like to think that this will be eventually properly regulated and not abused. But, well, we are all humans. We kind of know that this will eventually be abused. And there has been examples uh, in some cases, right? So autocracies tend to use that to, well, consolidate their power, right? Uh, I, I was thinking about this before, and let's say when, when the com computers were invented, right? Uh, you could, of course, use computers to scientific research, to, well, essentially to, to help people, or you could use computers to, well, build new technologies to control people. With AI, it's exactly the same. So I just think we have a much, much more powerful computer or like it's comparable to computer invention. You, you use the word train. And, and yeah. uh, I guess the context was train an AI model. Um, how do you do that? And can anyone do that? Can I do that? Um, and also, uh, does it require coding or, or just presenting data? Uh, so, yes, I mentioned training in the context of training uh, AI models. So, more specifically, these models are, are, well, deep learning models, which is like a particular kind of model. So, how does it work? You basically have a model with lots of different uh, variables that you want to find the right value to process your data. You don't know, uh, so you just show the model a lot of data. For example, the, the simplest example is you want to train a model to detect, to differentiate cats and dogs, right? 
you show this model a thousand images of dogs, a thousand images of cats, and you tell the model, this is a dog, this is a cat. Now you do it on your own. So in a way, the model is generalizing the data that you presented. So that's what I mean by training. Uh, sorry, what was the second question again? Can anyone do it? Uh, well, it has become easier. So at first, programming was a very, well, difficult task. And you have to study computer science for years and understand how programming languages work. It has become easier and easier. So a little bit more high level uh, in a way. Uh, a lot of the problem to train a new model is not on the knowledge, but on the hardware, because you need uh, very good hardware to do it, which normally people do not have. You can train a simple cat-dog model in your laptop. Most people could uh, by studying a little bit of coding, but this is not enough, right? If you want to train a model to recognize faces, you need much, a much more powerful hardware, much more powerful computer. And now people have uh, GPUs and all that. Uh, normally, the way it works is that they use GPUs from companies. Uh, many companies rent them. So, for example, I don't use, I have my laptop, but I, I would train my models remotely so in some uh, companies' cluster of GPUs. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that would be my answer. It's, it's becoming. Yeah, easier. the third and part now, I was. Yeah, no, sorry. Please, please continue. Now, uh, the last very recent step on how it has become easier and easier is this advent of large language language models like chat GPT, right? I think this is like a topic everywhere uh, now. And it's interesting even for me how quickly <clears throat> it's developed. So just before chat GPT appeared, I knew about some language models, but I was away for a few months away from, from work. And then when I came back, it was just like two weeks after chat GPT had been uh, released and a few other models quickly appeared. And you see how quickly that changed because now if I want to, for example, if I want to implement this cats and dog model, I can go to ChatGPT and say, please write me a piece of software that you implement using this or that model, uh, an AI software that will differentiate cats and dogs. And if you give you the code with some few mistakes that you have to catch, but it essentially gives you what in the past you would spend a day or maybe even more writing. So I see AI is kind of making itself a bit easier as time goes by. But but sorry, there was a third question that I think. No, I just thinking. wanted to know if you if you had to know any specific coding language in order to set up an AI program or whether it was agnostic. Well, it's in principle you can develop in any programming language, but most of the work has been done in Python, uh, which is a a specific programming language. You have frameworks developed, developed by, well, big tech companies nowadays that are open to use. So you, you can easily learn how then, I mean, easily, I mean, if you are, if you have some little bit of background in math and coding, you can understand, read all the documentation, uh, ask questions to chat GPT and kind of teach yourself and implement that using this free software that they provide. Uh, which is a little like a little bit of a detour, but it's another thing that I appreciate about AI. Uh, a lot of models are open source. So if you want to write your own model to detect cats and dogs, the standard procedure wouldn't even be let me write my own model. It would be let me check at this database of pre-trained models what people has have done. And it already like some obviously not Commercial companies do not open their code because, well, they are, it's how they make their money, right? But a lot of people contribute to this open community of software, which I find really, really interesting. And you kind of build on the work of other people. It's like, you know, every, every other kind of um, popular software, the development of the popular software. If you go on the web now and uh, you look for AI programs, you'll find uh, hundreds, hundreds. And some of them are way better than others. Some of them have better data, better models, and and so forth. Um, so I, I, you know, I I, I want to mention this uh, this movie I saw, and it's actually a play now in London, and it's it's called um, uh, Operation Mincemeat, 
And it's about a successful operation during the war, 1943, uh, where the Brits were able to deceive the Germans um, about where, exactly where, uh, the Allied forces would be um, attacking. And the question is whether it would be Italy or Greece. And they deceived them into believing it was Greece. And then they attacked, actually attacked in, in, um, you know, in Italy, as we all know. And that was a turning point. So, you know, what's interesting about that is um, that uh, deception is part of AI. I mean, I could make, uh, how do you know this is my voice? How do you know this is a picture, a video of me? How do I know it's a video of you? Because I can use AI and deceive you in every which way as to the voice and the video um, and what you are saying. I could create a completely fictitious deception using AI, and it would be very hard to decipher that. Am I right? Uh, yes, this has been a very recent development. Uh, it's called uh, generative AI models, which basically are models that create, uh, as you mentioned, voices, uh, images, uh, videos, music even, uh, about, well, they can kind of copy a, a voice of someone or a pattern, a musical style and so on. Uh, there are people also developing models to detect them, but it's a little bit of a competition, right? You develop a model that creates a better fake, you develop another model to better to detect fakes, and they kind of feed on each other and get better and better, but the problem is kind of always there, right? This is a, a little bit of the scary part. Like it make, it, it's also very, very difficult for uh, people working with law, right? Because how do, how can you say now a hundred percent with hundred percent certainty that something is really a piece of evidence or it hasn't been fabricated, right? And this is. This is an area that is still very, very new and very difficult. I don't think we have a final answer for how to deal with this problem, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, if you, if you ask me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the, the solution, actually. Well, you know, we know. talked about, this is an interesting point you mentioned. We talked about how, you know, the, 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 the white hats and the black hats uh, may use AI for different things. For, for good or, or for nefarious. Um, but there's another element too, and, and that is um, that the, um, the AI can be used to see if the other guy is sending you AI. <laughs> like, you know, for example, uh, chat GBT, um, students at uh, very important universities have written their term papers using AI. But then there are other students who have written AI programs to identify um, the uh, programs that are false. And so you get two sides, two sides of that equation also, uh, the AI to, uh, to search, search out the AI. <laughs> yeah, I have seen uh, recently I saw a very funny joke that uh, one professor was talking and he said, yeah, all my students keep saying, uh, I might write my papers with ChatGPT, and said, no problem, I might grade your paper with ChatGPT as well. <laughs> so it's like, okay, <laughs> you can have AI doing everything. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, after a while, it's going to be get the normal. Everybody is going to use AI to write papers, and the AI that's supposed to spot them won't be as good as the AI that wrote them. Um, but I think what, you know, what's interesting, and I'm coming to my uh, my case study with you. I want to have a case study with you. Um, so, <laughs> so if I want to plan something, if I want to plan an operation. If I want to plan uh, Operation Mincemeat, for example, uh, why don't I just trot out, uh, you know, uh, Chat GBT and say, how can I deceive the Germans into believing <laughs> the invasion will be in Greece, and um, it will immediately provide me with a plan, won't it? Um, so, uh, therefore, I could use AI, ChatGPT anyway, uh, to start my planning. And I wonder if that is so when you are looking to hold war criminals accountable. Uh, can you have AI write you a plan to find them? 
um, and to you know, mm, you know, uh, deal with them and to hold them accountable. Uh, is is that a, is that a worthy case study for you? Well, I think, I mean, we have to think first of, about how humans do it, like how the human uh, be able to to hold someone accountable for for war crimes. So you have to raise, so you have a, a set of. So we have the law, a set of rules that this person has to break to be considered a war criminal. And you can, in principle, have, this is not the case, but let's assume you have the best data sets in the world that contain all the possible information about everything that everybody has ever done. So in that case, you could have like a very, uh, an AI that looks at all the data and have a clear cut. Okay, criminal or not criminal. Uh, one thing that's a little bit dangerous uh, in this case is so AI is just as good as the data that you use to train the models. Therefore, biases are going to be there, right? And if we do go in a little bit of dangerous territory, especially uh, in cases that involve data about well, racial profiling and socioeconomic status and and all that. Like, it's just imagine how a human would generalize some kind of statistics. The AI would do the same. So. We still need someone to kind of check if the AI is actually doing what it is supposed to do. Um, and you can, play, uh, you can use an AI to check if the other AI is doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> but I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't say that it's very, very easy. Like we still have, humans still take context in, in, into account much more than AI. If that ever will change, that's that's a question for the future. It's, it's I guess it's more of a philosophical question about what makes us humans. Yeah. But you know, at these days, uh, you know, when I practiced law a long time ago, um, there were very few exhibits, very few uh, uh, documentary evidence, very few. And uh, now, um, you know, it's not uncommon to have uh, exhibits in the millions. Uh, which have to be evaluated and which have to be uh, authenticated and presented to the trier of fact. And the trier of fact could use AI to evaluate that. Um, and the lawyers on both sides could use AI to sort through those millions of documents. So this, this obviously would be helpful in a trial um, of, a, of any trial, but certainly in, a, in the trial um, of, a, of a war criminal to find him or her. Um, and to um, uh, line up the evidence and authenticate the evidence, present the evidence. And, uh, you know, in Ukraine, for example, we, we know through videos and testimonies and the like that there's an awful lot of evidence about an awful lot of war criminals. Um, and so, uh, but it hasn't really come to, to pass where these criminals are being taken in front of tribunals and tried uh, and punished. Um, that hasn't happened yet. And maybe what I hear you saying, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I make a guess and say, when that day comes, when the people you have identified through various sources as potential war criminals are in front of a court, AI is going to help you not only identify them, but try them. Am I right? Yes, and, and help to identify them and to identify all the pieces of evidence that help to prove the, all, all the, and the crimes, let's say. Because, uh, as you mentioned, for example, let's say you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of video about different events in, in Ukraine, for example. There is no lawyer in the world that's going to go through all those videos, look one by one. I mean, you can do that, and you take a hundred years to are able to, to actually identify everything. But you can use an AI tool to identify, for example, faces that appear in every video. So in which seconds, in which frames of the video do you have this person? In which frames do you have the car of this person? And where? And this can be done much, much quicker than a human do. So I think this is, as of today, I think this is probably the main contribution of AI is to help uh, sort through data and collect potential evidence 
to bring someone to trial. Mm -hmm. uh, in the trial itself, I'd still say it's, it's a little bit for the future and for, well, for, for lawyers to decide how much we want that to be the case, right? Uh, then that's a little bit of the end of AI as a tool, which is what I've been kind of selling so far, uh, and more to AI as a decision maker, which is, it has complicated generalizations, right? If you use that in courts, why not for the governments? Why not for decision making in the governments, right? And this is a completely different territory. Like I think as of today, uh, the best investment in AI and data analysis is, is how can it help us to sort through and identify evidence? Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you really, when you talk about uh, AI as a decision maker, the little black box that determines guilt or innocence, that's really that's... science fiction. But I agree, it's yeah. irresistible. It's irresistible and it will happen at some point, don't you think? <laughs> well, I think it depends a lot on us. Uh, I mean, AI will always be a black box in the sense that as a, oh, every model has billions, maybe two billions of parameters now. No human can go through all of them and understand what every number is doing. We hope it generalizes things in a useful way, which it does because, you know, there's just so many numbers, so much math. You are kind of just crunching your data in a big pile of math. Uh, but it's a, it's a black box. Like, we as humans, as a society, do we want to trust the black box? Uh, last, I also think it's important to comment that you have what people call adversarial attacks, which are ways to break the AI. So the classic example, you have a picture of an elephant. You put a little bit of random noise, random pixel colors, and suddenly it's not an elephant anymore. It's, I don't know, a panda bear or some other thing. Why? We don't really know. Lots of studies go into that. And until we understand, or I don't think this is actually going to be possible, but until you're sure that these attacks are not possible, personally, I don't think we should use AI as a decision maker because it will make mistakes given this kind of weird data, or let's say not weird, difference or very different state data points. Yeah. Well, the genie, the genie is out of out of the bottle, and uh, as I said, you know, Jack Smith, who is prosecuting Trump, uh, could probably use AI in organizing all those materials in various cases. And, and uh, the prosecutors around the country here uh, will think of that, and uh, they will think maybe they should use AI too in examining the documentary evidence and so forth. And the judges will want to have the benefit of that. So what you have is um, a, a perfectly legitimate and uh, constructive use of AI in enforcing the criminal law and uh, maintaining our democracy, if you will. But at the same time, you have autocrats who do precisely the same thing in order to destroy democracy somewhere else. So it goes to something you've referred to a couple of times, Bruno, and that is regulation. Um, and you, you, you've, you've kind of skipped that stone across the lake. But what about regulation? How in the world can you regulate this? So for, for the moment, in our case study, I'm going to make you the American Congress. You are oh, now that's... designated as the American <laughs> Congress. What in the world can you do to regulate AI? Well, there, there has been some tries. So, for example, that every company or everybody that uses AI should state that this is an AI-generated piece of data, image, or voice, or whatever. Uh, but th this is the easy part. Like you can regulate and say that companies cannot use data that, that have been acquired without consent to train their models. They can do that, for example. But that regulation is the easy part. Will it be done and how can you check it? Like how can you check if the data used to train a model has been acquired with consent? Are you good? No. How do you go through these millions and millions of pieces of information? Uh, it's it's a hard task. I, I don't know, like, I, I don't have an, an answer, actually. My my answer as, as the Congress would be, well, the companies producing the AI have to kind of convince us that this is a tool that's a safe tool. Same as, for example, computers. Like, I, 
we are convinced that using computers, that computers are tools that help us in every daily task, right? We know they can, every now and then they break, there's a bug here and there, and sometimes things don't work as we expect, but mostly they're fine. How, how did we get convinced of that? By using it for many, many years and improving, like constantly improving, fixing mistakes. I believe a Congress should look at AI in a similar way. At the beginning, right now, there will be tons of cases of people breaking violations, of computers exploding here and there, computers being, I don't know, computers misbehaving and having accidents and even killing people as it, it happens. But ideally, we should strive for an incremental development and slowly but surely get a better computer in the future as we do today. Well, I made you the Congress for a reason because Congress presumably, although um, you know one wonders about it these days, um, has the power to regulate. Um, but how you know how can any mm, legislature reach out and say, okay, we're all going to do this with pure heart. We're, <laughs> we're going to be moral. We're going to be ethical. We're not going to take advantage of anybody. We're going to be. It's like you'd have to write a new constitution of human affairs uh, in order in order to make sure that it was constructive and helpful to our global society. I, I myself, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I completely, I completely agree. But well, uh, another thing that is important to mention is that that I would be more comfortable with is knowing that, well, the, at least the people making these decisions in the Congress would know what they are making decisions about. Because you do have examples in, in many countries where clearly they have no clue how these things even work. And so those, as a Congress, are the first things I'd like to avoid. <laughs> you know, at least get advisors to explain you to, to a basic level how this works. You don't have to go into math. You don't have to go into coding. but like some things are very, you clearly see that people come from a world in which this was not a thing. And this will change in the future, right? The current generations are growing up in a world in which AI already existed. So how this is going to be, uh, how this is going to affect their decision maker in the future is a question that I can't even answer. Like, I, I think I, I wouldn't like to be in this uh, responsible decision maker role. It's it's a very maybe the hardest problem of our generation. Yeah, you know, I totally agree, and you really struck on something. That is, uh, the people who make the policy uh, or don't make the policy, people who are responsible to make the policy, have to learn how it works. And right now, it's hard to find policymakers who really know how it works. Uh, so I think that's really an important point, and we have to do what we can uh, to educate them or to cause them to be curious enough to learn. So uh, we're almost out of time, Bruno, and I want to ask you one last question. It's my five-year question. Okay. Now look forward, if you will, five years. Look forward uh, in Europe. Uh, look forward in the Ukraine war. I hope it's over. I hope it's over very, very soon, matter of fact. Um, look forward in, in government here in the U.S. and um, around the world. Um, how will AI change those things? Uh, how will they be affected, for better or worse? Well, first of all, this is an impossible question to, to answer 100% certainty. Uh, as an example, people would have thought Self-driving cars would be already a thing if you'd ask them 10 years ago, and we are not nearly there. How AI would change? So my, let's say, wild guess is these large language models like ChatGPT will be more and more incorporated in our everyday lives. And we won't do like investiga investigative analysis without them anymore, because a lot of people will just incorporate them into their work. Uh, in terms of war, we, we see that already. So like drones, for example, drone attacks, like they are all coordinated by algorithms that have been developed with AI. So these kinds of warfare are gonna become more and more common and they're gonna well they are already changing like traditional traditional warfare. Like you've seen Ukraine was able to attack like Russia. I mean or drones have been struck 
uh, and deep behind the front lines. And this is this is just gonna get better and better, like better drone controlling algorithms, better, uh, well, better data collection tools, better recording, more and more data and more, uh, well, let's say AI to deal with this volume of collected data. But my personal guess, large language models are the are what's gonna be more uh, affecting our lives and all uh, all questions in five years. Will it will it be a better world? Oh, well, that's very hard to say. <laughs> Depends what you mean by better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good a good answer. <laughs> uh, I, I would say. As someone working with uh, tech and uh, AI, I try to make it, but well, if I, if it works, it remains to be seen. Well, it goes to show you're a very important person, and uh, anyone in your shoes is an important person because this will have a huge effect on our society. Uh, Bruno del uh, Papa, thank you very much for joining us from from Lisbon. Thank you very much for discussing these things with us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. Um, yeah, it was a very nice talk. Aloha. <laughs> Bye.